Well, I'm in there as a co-host. Oh, hi, Sue. Hi, is that um, Karen? Hi, Karen Dostal. <laughs> and Bob Lane. Hi. Well, okay, there's a few more people I'm admitting. Um, but if you want to go ahead and um, say hello, that's fine, Ned. You're sure. welcome to do so. And uh, I will do so. I'd like to welcome all of our guests this evening to our March meeting and program. We have another very interesting program this month, and we're happy to have you with us. This past month, we've had one of our long-term board members, Sue Hall, uh, had a medical procedure in the hospital, and we're very happy that she is back home. However, uh, she is not yet uh, accepting any visitors and cards are welcome, but please postpone any visits for a little while while she gets back on her feet. Um, this month's uh, speaker will be introduced by Susan Schuler. Susan? Okay, thanks, Ned. We are in a tr for a treat, another treat. Every month we have a treat, right? Um, but this is one of our own, um, our board member, Chris or Eric Anderson, who is going to be taking us on a journey um, telling us about a story of the Wisconsin state natural areas. And then he's going to trickle in a little bit of adventure, um, recent adventure from Big Bend National Park as well. Eric Anderson is an Emirates professor of wildlife ecology at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Many people on this call have either um, had interacted with him, been on the board with him, maybe even learned from him through, as students and is also the chair of the Natural Areas Protection Council, a body that advises the state natural areas program. I'm so excited because I consider Eric a dear friend as well. He has inspired me a lot in my career and also um, took us on a great journey to South Africa where I had a trip of a lifetime, I have to say. Um, and so that's been fun. I'm, I'm really happy to introduce Eric tonight and with that, I have to leave you with a quote he also uses, I share with him, of Miss Friz Frizzle, the magic school bus, where her quote is, is, take chances, make mistakes, and get messy. And it's a quote that Eric has used before in his life as well. So, Eric, take chances, make mistakes, and get messy. <laughs> well, thank you, Susan. You've covered all the bases. So if I really blow this tonight, it won't be a problem. So thank you for that introduction. That was very, very kind. Um, I think most of you that signed up for this program were anticipating hearing me talk tonight about the Wisconsin State Natural Areas and the threats that they're currently facing. And that's absolutely true what you will be hearing. But I don't think what you anticipated was to get a small little travel log of Big Bend National Park. Now, it's not because I just got done with my second year of volunteering down at the park there, but it has actually everything to do with thinking about how we might be able to make the state natural area program work better in the future. So with that as kind of a introduction to where we're going today, let me tell you a little bit about Wisconsin state natural areas to start with. I want to start with an Aldo Leopold quote uh, out of his uh, Sand County Almanac about uh, if the land mechanism as a whole is good, then every part is good, whether we understand it or not. To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. I like that quote because it really is the foundation for what the state natural area program is trying to do. It's essentially trying to save every cog and wheel within the ecosystems of Wisconsin. So specifically, if you look at what the purpose of the state natural area program is, it's attempting to protect natural communities, as well as some geologic formations and archeological sites for not only research and education, but primarily as refuges for biological diversity and for endangered or threatened species within the state. So it's a big task to try to identify the places within the state that will allow us to do 
those sorts of things. So let me fill you in a little more background about the state natural areas. It started back in 1945, actually with an idea that was spawned by Aldo Leopold, and he created a committee called the, now it's currently called the Natural Areas Preservation Council, which I'm currently serving as the chair on. And what he did was he put together this committee to protect areas of unique botanical interest, either by gift or purchase. He gathered together a bunch of university professors, most of them from the University of uh, Wisconsin at Madison, and created this advisory panel that began to look across the state for places of high importance in terms of their composite of uh, endangered species, and at that time, mostly plant-oriented. So it wasn't until 1951 that the state legislature got around to formalizing this whole group. There was absolutely no staff or budget until 1966. But now we have a whole office that's devoted to state management of these state natural areas and also to identify and put in place the ability to purchase some of these lands that the state finds particularly important. So until that happened, until this got well established within the DNR, most of that uh, information for where to put these places was coming from university professors at mostly at Madison. And they were feeding that information into the DNR and then working through the process of acquiring those lands. Now, the whole underlying approach for the state natural areas at least for the last three or four decades, has been something called gap analysis. What we've been trying to do is look across the state of Wisconsin and identify where are all the different kinds of uh, natural communities and do we have a, a hunk of that area preserved? So it's what we call a coarse filter. The idea being that if you save the habitat, you're gonna save many of the species that are associated with it. So. We have identified within the state 99 different community types. And out of those 99 different community types, we actually at this point in time have 96% of representation by all of those types. So we've really been able to get a, a snapshot of what the natural vegetation of Wisconsin looked like in all these different community types. The idea being that we're looking at kind of a pre-settlement vegetation look at Wisconsin. The idea also being that if you save the plants, you save the animals that are also associated with those plants. So right now, scattered throughout the state is indicated by these black dots are about 691 of these state natural areas. They cover the area of about 4,000 uh, acres, for, excuse me, 400,000 acres, which is roughly about 80% um, the size of Portage County. So just kind of take all those areas, put them all together, and it would be an area about the size of Portage County. And these dots, however, represent areas that go from being three acres in size all the way up to being almost 10,000 acres in size. So there's a huge disparity in the sizes of the state natural areas. And if you look at how they're aggregated here, you'll notice that most of the state natural areas, by far 70% or greater of them are less than one square mile in size. So they're all pretty small areas. There are a few large ones, but for the most part, they're all small, tiny, scattered out areas across the state. But 691 is a lot of areas. If you look at the state map again, you'll notice there's a few areas of intense concentration. These represent areas of pretty high biological diversity and uniqueness. So take a look at the Door County Peninsula. You see all the dots on that? And take a look at the lower Wisconsin drainage. You'll also see a whole series of dots there. And then your eye should be drawn to that series of dots that are kind of up to the northern part of the state there in the Northern Highland Forest area. All of those areas are particularly rich in biological diversity. In the Kettle Moraine area as well, you can kind of see some hot spots 
there. So there are concentrations, but they're pretty widely spread throughout the state here. What we've found out at this point is that about 90% of Wisconsin's rare plants and about 75% of Wisconsin's rare animal species are represented in the state natural areas. That's a pretty phenomenal representation to have captured in these little pockets that are spread throughout the area. What am I talking about here? I'm talking about things that include, you know, endangered plants like facets local weed and um, insects like the um, Heinz emerald uh, dragonfly or the spruce grouse in some of our northern areas as well. And then, of course, we've got state natural areas that hold in them the American martin, which is our only endangered mammal in Wisconsin. But beyond that, it's important to realize and remember that these areas are not just terrestrial areas. Many of the state natural areas either include or are almost exclusively um, uh, wetland areas. So they become a, a crucially important piece of the puzzle here in terms of when you're managing, you can't just think about terrestrial environments. You have to think about what's going on in the aquatic systems as well here. So taking a look at what I've showed you so far, we have been remarkably successful. The state has allocated lots of funds towards purchasing these lands when they become available. There's been some of the best mines within the DNR that have been identifying those areas. However, it's also important to understand that these areas aren't just created and then set aside as little zoos or botanical gardens. These are areas that require some pretty intensive management uh, on some of them. So some of them require regular burning. Many of our grasslands have to be regularly burned. Some of our oak savanna areas also need regular burning. There's just a lot of management that has to go on in that realm in terms of trying to keep those areas from closing in by forests. Here in central Wisconsin, with the exclusion of fire, every piece of open land begins to fill in with white pine and even the forests that we have, the oak savanna areas, get filled in by fire intolerant species like red maple. So if you wanna maintain what was natively there before settlement times, you need to have that active management of burning in order for that to occur. And there also has to be management for people, whether it's motorcycles running through or ATVs or dogs off of leash in those areas or recreational uses of these state natural areas rather than the intended research and educational uses. It doesn't mean that you can't visit nor can't hunt in these areas, but it does mean that there are certain uses for them that are totally prohibited. You can go out there and collect mushrooms, but you can't go out there and, you know, um, permanently remove anything from the area, plants or things like that. Things that are transient, you're welcome to have. Also, as you know, invasive species can take over very quickly in an area if we don't actively manage for them. So many of these state natural areas have some kind of control going on for invasive species, which if it's a three acre state natural area, it's very easy to do. If the area is 10,000 acres in size, that's incredibly difficult to try to accomplish. So um, as we can see, there's a lot of active management going on. One more point that I'd like to make too is that some of these state natural areas can be loved to death. A small area that attracts a lot of people to come visiting it is a real problem, a real issue. And so there needs to be at some of the more popular areas, at least some pretty intensive um, people management in order to maintain the integrity of those areas. Okay, I wanna leave the state natural areas for just a moment. And I wanna move south about 1500 miles if we can do that for a moment. I wanna take you to Big Bend National Park. Big Bend is one of the largest, most remote, and one of the least visited national parks in the contiguous United States. Um, 
if I could see your hands, I would ask how many people have been to Big Bend? And I would imagine a few of you have been there, but I bet a lot of people have not had the opportunity to ever visit Big Bend National Park. However, it lives very south in Texas. As you can see uh, indicated on this map here by that red arrow that the, um, the national park itself sits in the bend of the Rio Grande River, hence the name Big Bend as the river makes this big sweep down south and then turns north and turns back south again to empty out into the Gulf of Mexico. So it's located right on the border of um, Mexico and there's about 180 miles that is shared with the Mexican border at that particular point. This park is huge. It covers over 800,000 acres. That is roughly a park the size of Rhode Island, actually a little bit bigger than Rhode Island. So you begin to understand the enormity of this park. That is a really big, a big area. And if you look at the differences in elevation within the park itself, it's more than a mile. So you go from being down at the Rio Grande at about 1700 feet uh, in elevation, and then it moves all the way up to the top of the Chisos Mountains, which is about 7,800 feet. So almost a mile of difference between the lowest and the highest point. And what happens in that mile is you get changes in vegetation because the temperature changes, the moisture changes, and a lot of other conditions change as well. So what we see is a huge variety based on the fact that we've got this real disparity in elevation within the park that's happening. So it goes from this lowland area, mostly desert scrub with uh, uh, a few creosote uh, bushes and some cactus in there. And it moves from that area upward into an area that gets a little more moisture, supports a grassland, so tall grassland, it's called these uh, agaves that look something like uh, a, a yucca plant that occur in that grassland. And then finally you get up to the high chisos where you end up having trees and the greatest amount of rainfall that happens throughout the park is within this mountain range. Okay, if we look across all the parks that are in uh, North America or at least within the continental United States, we see that this is one of the most biologically diverse parks that are out there, which makes you have to start asking the question, why is that? Let's take a look at a few of those things that make it so biologically diverse. This is the vermilion flycatcher, which is a fairly common migrant that occurs along the uh, banks of the Rio Grande River. This bird and lots of other birds make uh, their home there at a Big Bend National Park. But there's one bird that is found in Big Bend and Big Bend alone. That's the Colima warbler. And maybe some of you, I believe Kent Hall may be one of those, has actually seen that bird. It happens at high elevation. Uh, it is a migrant, but this is the only place in the United States where that bird actually nests. It's a more Southern ranged species. So there are lots of unique birds on the landscape there. An incredible diversity of plants, the agave or century plant. It doesn't take really a century for it to mature, but it takes 25 to 30 years to build up enough energy within the root structure that it can send up this towering um, vegetative flowering part. And then immediately upon flowering after 25 to 30 years, it dies and hopes that it carries on by being pollinated by bats and sending those seeds then out across the landscape. Also, there's a huge abundance of insects within the park itself. And because there's an abundance of insects, there's also abundance of not only insect eating birds, but bats as well. Big Bend National Park has one of the highest diversities of bats of all of the parks in uh, North America. And of course, 
there are those large ranging carnivore species. Mountain lions are commonly found in uh, Big Bend National Park, although most people don't see them. But most every part of the park gets traversed by these mountain lions. But there's another carnivore that happens in the park. This is a really interesting story. That's the black bear. Um, the black bear actually disappeared from Big Bend National Park before it became created in 1944. So Big Bend is a relatively new park, um, emerging in the 40s as, you know, just prior to World War II ending. And at that point in time, bears had probably been gone for maybe 20 or 30 years. Then in the late 1980s, bears begin to show up again in the Chisos Mountains. They're pretty much living in the Chisos Mountains, but they do go out into the lower lands around it, but oftentimes will return back to the Chisos because that's where most of their food is available to them year round. Interesting thing is we know based on DNA samples that those bears came from Mexico. So they wandered into the park, uh, swam across or probably just waded across the Rio Grande River and moved their way into the Chisos Mountains after having been gone for at least probably 60 years or so from that area. Their population is now well established, so well established that everywhere in the park that you can camp, whether it be back country or whether it's in a camping area, you have a bear proof box that's provided for you where you can put all of your food stuff. So you never have to leave them in a tent and you never have to provide temptation for a bear to get a bad relationship with humans. When you have 20 to 30 bears only, in the park, you have to be really careful about every single one of them to make sure that you don't lose any of that biological diversity that you've got within the genes of them. So the question is, where'd those bears come from? I said they came from Mexico, we know that, but where specifically in Mexico did they come from? Well, if you start looking at a map, you look just across the Rio Grande border that makes up this southern boundary of the park, and you'll see there are three large protected area. Off to the southwest is the Santa Elena Canyon protected area that is a large Mexican protected wildland. If you go directly south of the park, there's another one that's called the Ocampo protected area, and that area also is a large protected region. And then finally, if you go over to the Southeast, you'll see the Maderas del Carmen protected area, which also borders up against the park. So the entire Southern border of the park is all protected wild areas. And although you can't see it well on this map, on the East side of the park, there is a wildlife management area. And that wildlife management area is essentially undeveloped wildland. And if you go off to the western side of the park, it's a very large state park. So this entire park is surrounded by more wilderness areas, which um, becomes pretty important as we carry on this discussion about how Wisconsin is going to try to fix its problems relative to state natural areas. So one thing I need to tell you real quickly is the geology in this park has so much to do with what you find there. If we just go back 500 million years, we can see that on the landscape of this park, it is a jumbled mess. It's been called a, a, a geologist paradise, but it's also been called a geologist nightmare because it is so many interacting phases of development over the last 500 million years that it's led to all these different kinds of landforms. But there are a few key main things that are happening here. First of them, if we go back about 500 million years, is the idea of mountain building. If you think about it for a minute, why in the heck is it that the river, the Rio Grande, makes this turn to the south and then cuts back north again before again going south and getting to the Gulf of Mexico. That has everything to do with essentially the 
mountains of the Appalachian Mountains and the mountains of the Rocky Mountains converging together right there in the National Park. And what that's done is it set the stage for all sorts of things that happen in the next phases of development of this park, which is that area in between those mountain ranges became a series of shallow seas over time, which meant this was during the age of dinosaurs, which means there's all sorts of fossils that have been laid down in the sediments that accumulated there. And we're talking about hundreds of um, uh, feet of sediments uh, that were collected there. And it's just a, it is a fossil hunter's paradise in this region for that exact reason. Lay on top of that active volcanism that's happened in a more recent time period with layers of hot ash called tuff that have been laid down in some areas. And now what you've got is this smorgasbord of things that have led to different soil types, to different drainage patterns, to all sorts of different stages that affect the kind of vegetation that you find in areas out there. And of course, oh, pardon me for this, I just need to step back here for a minute. Um, of course, what's happened since all this has been occurring and constantly while it was occurring is this uplift and erosion. So if you take a look at the Santa Elena Canyon where the Rio Grande actually breaks through at the beginning of the park, you can see that um, huge uplift has occurred bringing these mountain cliffs up and being cut down through, incised through by the Rio Grande River. So it's, it's dramatic and it certainly has a big impact on the vegetation in the region there. So why is it that there are so many species in Big Bend? Well, I think you probably can answer that question already. But one of the reasons is the size of the park. Because it's so big, it incorporates so many different habitat types, each of which support different plants, which support different uh, organisms within them. So size has much to do with it. Also, when an area is large, it also means that you have larger populations of individual species. So it's much less likely that those populations are gonna be wiped out by a random event that might possibly occur out there. So size has much to do with why there are so many species in the Big Bend area. And the consequence of that, as I alluded to, is the fact that there's a variety of ecosystems that get represented within the park. And each one of those has their own suite of species leading to a huge amount of biological diversity within the park itself. I mentioned that it's surrounded by natural areas to the south and to a state park and a wildlife management area on the east and west sides. That adjacency and the fact that the whole park is not broken up by roads or development or other things allows for species like, as we just talked about, the bear, for example, to disappear and then to have it recolonized by bears moving from a protected area nearby to the south, in this case, in Mexico. So this adjacency of colonizing sources and the connection that all these different habitat types have within this area allows for movement of both plants and animals from one place to another, which assures that the biological diversity stays very high within those regions. There's also another interesting thing going on within the park, which is what we call elevational connection, which means that there is a whole mountain range in the park called the Chisos Mountains. The entire mountain chain is in the park. So from the lowlands to the upper areas, are completely within the park, which means that if a species finds that a drought is occurring or that climate change is increasing the temperature in the areas where it's been living, it can move up in elevation and find the components that it needs to live in those higher elevations. So you kind of have a built-in sort of uh, escalator that will take species up 
when they need to, and if we should go back into some other kind of a climate change, allow those species to move back down into a environment that they used to be found in. So this elevational connection becomes a pretty important component. Also another component that happens within Big Bend National Park, and one of the reasons it has so many species is what we call ecological integrity. There are not a lot of human created disturbances within the park. There's 200 miles of roads within an area that's the size of Rhode Island that is, that's negligible. There are no cities. There's very little human habitation within the park itself. Visitors during the winter months and permanent residents that work for the park service, but beyond that, not much. So there's really complete ecological integrity within the area. So that's another great thing that Big Bend has going for us. So Big Bend is really a jewel. And if you haven't had an opportunity to go see it, I suggest you find a way to try to get yourself down to it. The park itself is not a place you wanna visit in the summertime. By the time they get to May, they're hitting 100 degrees and it stays 100 degrees until about September. And, uh, and June is the worst month uh, until the monsoons start hitting in July and rain actually starts falling. But last year in the park, they got six inches of rainfall. So, it's an incredibly dry environment. So the winter months are the best months in which to visit this particular uh, area. Okay, time for us to go back to Wisconsin here. The topic that I was gonna talk about today is the fact that our state natural areas are under attack. And they're under attack, not from a concerted effort, but a multitude, a multi-faceted approach that are taking this highly successful 691 different state natural area program to be totally ineffective in preserving biological diversity into the future. So let's take a look real quickly at what some of those factors are that have put our state natural areas under attack. The first of them and perhaps the largest of them can be easily seen in this illustration I've got up on the screen here. You'll notice on the left-hand side, that's what pre-settlement vegetation looked like in the state of Wisconsin. You may notice that the southern part of the state and the western part of the state dominated by prairies and grasslands, areas that if you look at the other side, which is what Wisconsin looks like now, are almost totally gone. We just don't have those large extensive prairies that we used to have. And you'll also notice that much of the forest has been diminished both in size and continuity. It's not all connected together like it used to be. It's broken up into small patches. So what we've seen going on here is not only a loss of habitat, but the habitat that we do have is being broken up into smaller and smaller pieces. And that means that smaller populations, much more vulnerable to winking out or disappearing uh, in the big picture. So that becomes a threat to a lot of these little parcels that we've set aside, these little isolated uh, areas. So habitat loss and fragmentation of big issue in terms of why those species are not found and why our areas are under attack. We also have altered our natural disturbance patterns. Fire used to be something that happened regularly and easy to understand when we're talking about grasslands. It was not uncommon for a wildfire to start and for in a grassland area by a dry strike. And that wildfire could carry for 15, 20 miles across the landscape. That doesn't happen anymore. We just have too much human occupation of the landscape, too many barriers put in and not in large enough area for that kind of thing to occur. But what that allowed to have happen is that the probability of lightning striking in one area and starting a fire in that area was pretty small, but if it started in that area, its chances of spreading to a lot of other areas, much, much better. 
We don't have that kind of disturbance regime, and we are anxious to put out fires that are anywhere close to human habitation, which obviously, especially for southern Wisconsin, is a huge issue. So we've also got this altered hydrologic cycle and the hydrology of the soils themselves. So we see that um, damming of rivers has made a big difference in terms of soil moisture. And a problem that occurs here in particular in central Wisconsin, where the, we have these high capacity wells that are draining our groundwater to the point where Little Plover River dries up. When the Little Plover River dries up, those species that are unique to that particular drainage disappear. They're not there anymore because the springs that feed them are not occurring. So we've altered these natural disturbances by our use of the landscape as intensively as we've used it. And then of course, we've got the ever present danger of invasive species. And whether I'm talking about garlic mustard or I'm talking about glossy buckthorn, both of which I think everybody is pretty familiar with. These are non-native species that have moved into an area where they don't bring with them the things that they had controlling them in the native area they came from. So let's look at garlic mustard, for example. Garlic mustard came primarily from Europe. In Europe, there were insects that would feed on it. There were diseases that would affect it. When the seeds for garlic mustard got over here, those parasites and diseases and predators just didn't come over with them. So when they get here, it's like, I'm free. And they release themselves and just go extremely crazy numerically, which means they've got a competitive advantage over all the other native species and they can wipe them out very, very quickly. They just outcompete everything else. That's why invasive species are really important to try to eliminate here. Oh, and I have to give a nod to one of the newer invasive species, which some of you out there have had some intimate experience which, with, which is the, uh, uh, the hogweed, the giant hogweed, which is uh, an invasive species moving in again from uh, Eastern Europe that has been found actually here in Portage County with some pretty significant human impacts to the, uh, the juices within the plant itself. One other thing that's going on here is an overabundance of deer populations. Take a look at this photograph. You'll see that there's an enclosure and on the left-hand side, deer are excluded from it. On the right-hand side, deer are allowed to graze and browse. You can see immediately what happens. It changes the species composition. There are certain things that deer absolutely like. One of those things being maples. And they can, in a forest at overabundant number, eliminate uh, the maple trees and create a canopy that is very different than what would be there if there weren't high deer numbers. And we have such high deer numbers because of the things that we do, particularly with agriculture, that allows those numbers to get excessive uh, and in bigger numbers than would be expected. Notice another thing missing on the right-hand side of that photograph. There are no shrubs there. And with no shrubs, it means all the insects that are associated with shrubbery are gone. The birds that require shrubs to live in and breed in aren't there. And so bird species diversity drops. So the overall diversity of the area drops significantly. I'm and if we're talking about a, a white cedar swamp, oh, see the difference. very little reproduction Maybe. that goes on if you have high deer numbers, because every time a white cedar sticks up above the snow line, it'll be browsed right down and will be eliminated from the, the landscape there. Mm -hmm. Here's a look at what's happened to deer populations yeah. since the 1960s. And what you should mm -hmm. see pretty clearly mm -hmm. from this is that deer numbers have increased at least five fold from what they used to be. So there is no doubt that in the state of Wisconsin, we're seeing an increasing overabundance of deer. Even with the wolves that are on the landscape, they have 
very little control, at least in a big picture uh, sense, and certainly in Southern Wisconsin, on the actual number of deer that are out there. So a huge problem from this overabundance of, of deer here. Another insidious problem that not many people are aware of is that over the last 200 years, we have seen a dramatic increase in the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that are being deposited in the landscape of Wisconsin. And it comes in the form of precipitation. Most of our natural communities, the plants are adapted to a low nitrogen condition because that's the way it's been for eons of time, not much nitrogen present. When there is nitrogen present, it favors those plants that can take advantage of having all that nitrogen. And just like when you fertilize your lawn, your lawn goes crazy and it crowds out all sorts of other plant species and weeds, which is what you want it to do. However, it's not what we want to do with our state natural areas. We're trying to protect those species that are rare and that are native to the area. And the minute you put nitrogen in there, they can't compete with the species that can use that nitrogen and grow like crazy. So they're outcompeted right away. So this nitrogen and phosphorus deposition increase has been dramatic. And if we look at just nitrogen deposition, it's increased 10 to 30 times more than the background rate was 200 years ago in Southern Wisconsin. That is the dramatic increase and has radically changed what the landscape can support in that area. So think about it. We've been trying to save these little jewels of the pre-settlement vegetation of Wisconsin in our state natural areas. And now we're making all these dramatic changes to it that it is in possible to try to hold them as these little jewels across the landscape. And now I need to mention the biggest issue over all of this whole thing, and that is the whole idea of climate change. There have been a number of speakers over the year that's, that have talked here at Audubon. You can certainly hear about it everywhere, and it's there is no doubt that we're having a change in our climate and it's having a huge impact on these natural areas. Remember, they're fixed, they're stationary, they're not moving. This is where that protected area is. And as the environment changes, the temperature changes or the precipitation changes, what was a perfect condition for a plant may no longer be that for them. So climate change is a huge game changer for this idea we had of being able to set aside these little protected areas to make sure we hang on to the biological diversity into the future. I think I can probably summarize best what lies at the heart of climate change for Wisconsin, and that is Wisconsin isn't getting that much warmer, although the average temperature is getting warmer. It's that it's getting less cold. And by getting less cold, we're seeing things like boreal forests in Wisconsin completely disappear. We're seeing species that are on the southern extent of their range disappear because they aren't getting the cold winters that they need to continue to be able to exist or the snow cover that they require. So it's a whole cascading chain of events that happen from this uh, temperature change changes in moisture, we get these severe weather events, invasive species uh, are favored by um, climate change and plant ranges are completely changing. So what we end up with is a very, very different set of circumstances that underlie every one of these protected areas. Okay. For the reasons that I just outlined, and for a lot more that I didn't have time to go into, we've got to move beyond this paradigm of relying on trying to preserve these pre-settlement plant communities spread across the Wisconsin landscape. If nothing else changed, that might have been a viable option, but everything has changed around those parcels and within those parcels 
as well. So the idea of simply setting aside these protected areas is no longer gonna be enough to be able to preserve them. So if I were you, I'd be asking the question, what do we do now then? How, how do you fix that problem? And this is a point where we get an opportunity to take a trip back to Big Bend, because I think we're gonna find that Big Bend actually has a lot of answers for us in terms of what we might be able to do in Wisconsin that could allow us to maintain the variety of species that we had protected within those areas. But it's gonna require a real mind shift for how we go about acquiring and managing the land that we're working with here. So in order to understand what we can do, we need to look at why Big Bend has been so species rich and what they've done to be able to be so resilient over the years, having species like, like the bear come back and reoccupy the landscape. First off, what happened in Big Bend is exactly what the State Natural Areas Program did for the first 50 or 60 years of its existence, which is, to give ecological representation to all those different community types. So in Big Bend, whether it's the high elevation forests of oak or whether it's the dry, parched, arid landscapes of the lowlands, all of those have their unique suite of species that occupy them. And so the area is so large, it incorporates many of those unique areas. So that's what we've already done a pretty good job of doing within the state natural areas program here. And in particular, what the uh, Big Bend does is water becomes a key element in terms of a lot of the diversity that occurs. And so areas that are water rich are well mapped within the park and well known and well protected as well. Not as big an issue in Wisconsin, but still protection of some unique uh, areas is always gonna be crucial to do. The size of Big Bend is incredibly important. How does that translate to Wisconsin? We need to start thinking much bigger. Three acres in size no longer is gonna do anything except give us a botanical garden that we're gonna to have to keep manicuring in order to keep all the species existing within them. We need to think big. We need to think large, both in terms of the actual protected area, but then effectively enlarging some of those protected areas by giving a buffer zone around them, not allowing cities or development to press right up against them because they have their own threats that they bring into these natural areas. Also, getting this adjacency of other natural areas together and connecting these natural areas together is something that happens within Big Bend. And it becomes a crucial part for the state of Wisconsin to also think about. And wherever we possibly can, we need to address that uh, elevation or habitat connection that we might be able to make in areas where we can actually allow for some of this motion of species from south to north and from lower elevations to higher elevations. We don't have big peaks in Wisconsin, but there is a definitely an altitudinal variation that happens within our state. And so that becomes another important crucial part that we can start thinking about in our acquisition of land for this state natural area program. We also need to start thinking about ecological integrity. We need to find areas that are not disturbed by humans, places that aren't bordered by lots of fragmentation, lots of development to allow us to put these protected regions in areas that aren't gonna be compromised in the future by development around them. It's a tall order and all of those factors that work in Big Bend have the potential for working here in Wisconsin. Right now, the DNR is writing a strategic plan, which follows a lot of what I've just talked about 
tonight. What will become the more difficult part is how you translate these big, broad goals to actual reality on the ground in the state of Wisconsin, where buying land is expensive. And sometimes the places that you want to protect just aren't available. But there's a lot of people that are engaged in the protection of the landscape here in Wisconsin. And I think that with the combination of cooperation within those different groups of people, the continued flow of resources, both into the DNR and into the acquisition, or at least within uh, the protection of some of these areas around these state natural areas, we may be able to effectively keep the species diversity that we have in the state and ensure that it's gonna be here in the future. What we're trying to do is a fine balancing act between what the human needs are in the state of Wisconsin and what we need to do in order to maintain the biological legacy that we have here in the state. It can happen, but it can only happen with the will and the energy of a lot of people to do it. But I'm certainly hopeful that we can and will do that in the future. So with that, I'd be glad to entertain any questions that anybody might have. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks, Eric. We really appreciate that. And there, there's no questions in the chat box yet, but um, if people do have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask a question at this time if you have that for Eric. So take us off, honey. I have a question for you, Eric. What, how do we do this with so much private land? So when you say acquisition of land, are you really targeting private land owners or trusts, um, something like that? Yeah, absolutely. A trust will pay, play a huge role in trying to make this work in terms of getting private landowners that want to donate, but also to be strategic in it. You can't just say, oh, we'll take everything. You really want to try to have a focus to what you're trying to accomplish, which means that, you know, somebody might have an old gravel pit that they don't want anymore, that they want to donate to the state. The only problem with that is it will take a long time for that old gravel pit to actually be able to support the kind of recovery that needs to happen to make it uh, valuable in the future. But again, buffer areas can be all sorts of things. If, if you can turn your gravel pit into a natural area as opposed to turn it into a subdivision, that's a much preferred option. So kind of hard to say no to any of that kind of stuff. So good, good question, Susan. Gene? Anyone else? Oh, there's one. Um... Ned asks, was there some of Trump's border wall built through Big Bend National Park and did this <laughs> interfere with the park's integrity? I kind of was curious about that too. <laughs> I, I debated whether I'd mentioned that or not. Um, there were plans- Leave it to, to Ned. Yeah, <laughs> there, were, <laughs> there were plans to uh, put the border wall in and the border wall um, clearly would not be a problem for birds. Most insects would not be an issue but you try to get a bear across a border wall and that isn't gonna happen. And so the bears that freely colonized uh, within the park there never, never would have colonized had there been a, a border wall there. I must tell you the Rio Grande is ankle deep right now. You can walk across mm -hmm. it from Mexico. It's, it's not a substantial barrier. And so, um, Oh yes, and, and there, are, there are some natural cliffs that occur within the park that act as a natural barrier. But nonetheless, the, a border wall there would prevent us from getting things like ocelots, jaguarundis, mm -hmm. even jaguars that may eventually move their way north into the United States because they no longer find the, the climate uh, acceptable that far south. So we would miss a lot of opportunities. Thankfully, they have not built any wall. And because of the isolation of this area, there's very little border crossing that goes on. It's just too isolated, it's too hot in the summer, and it's too dangerous. Um, so very little oh, crossing. 
Yeah. Thanks. Hi. How Jean's can the deer? Oh, oh go ahead. Jean had her hand go up. Go ahead, Jean. I was just curious. Um, have you coord has your group coordinated efforts with groups like the Nature Conservancy or the Aldo Leopold Foundation because they oh. do some of the same kind of work? Yes, absolutely. In uh, the the state natural area program wouldn't be where it is right now, Gene, without, yeah. those are two of the big players here, TNC and also the uh, Leopold Foundation. But there are many, many other smaller areas and there are actually some state natural areas that occur on private lands where they are still owned by the individuals, but they have been put into a trust such that they won't be uh, altered in, in the future. So we're trying to call in as many cards as we possibly can. And the state, uh, in particular, uh, Thomas Meyer, who is in, in charge of the state natural area programs, has done a wonderful job of not only parlaying these hot spots into actual uh, state natural areas, but creating the relationships with people. So it's just done a done a terrific job. The state is really committed to this this project and this program. And how, and how are they marked? How are they? How do you know where these areas are? Yeah, the there are several places that you can go to find them. But the best place to go is the DNR website called State Natural Areas, and all six hundred and ninety one of them can be found on that website. Each one of those areas have a map associated with them and they have how you can access them. Uh, there's at least one individual in the state who is attempting to visit every single one of the state natural areas, all 691 of them. So it's a, uh, it's a grand endeavor. And uh, I think he's been working on it three years now. So he's, uh, he's getting close to being successful though, pretty, pretty wild. But yeah, the website has all that kind of information. Great question, Jean, great question. Thank you. Hey, Jan asks, how can deer population be gradually, I think it's reduced? <laughs> oh, great question. And one that I'm afraid I can't give you a very good answer for because um, biologists, conservation biologists would have set harvest levels much higher and would see deer population much lower. But it's not in our hands to decide that. The state of Wisconsin has a long tradition of deer hunting and people wanna have adequate number of deer to hunt. And mm -hmm. that means that much of the power for the deer population size resides in the hands of, of the people as, as it should. So it's an educational process where we need to get people to understand that having this many deer has costs associated with it. So maybe we can't rely on being successful every year getting a deer. Maybe we have to change people's expectations in terms of the hunt that's out there. So just some ideas about what we might wanna alter in the future. Yeah, this is a question I was also curious about. Jim Rogers asks, what were the primary sources of atmospheric nitrogen and phosphorus that you had mentioned? Yeah, um, nitrogen is pretty easily laid at the feet of agriculture. Uh, and um, most of it has to do with ammonia release and then uh, that getting into the atmosphere and being carried, uh, well, from the ag lands to the west of us in with the rain. That's why Southern Wisconsin gets hit so hard by it because of all that agricultural land that we have off to the um, west of us there. So, and, and um, you know, we get dust clouds that come from the Sahara and in that contains a lot of phosphorus, believe it or not. And so the deforestation and the desert of the uh, Sahara Desert has led to uh, issues that we're having here in North America as well. Thanks. I have a question on the state naturals area. What was the newest state natural area that was most recently added? Is this an ongoing, you're still looking for plots or expanding plots? Just yeah. I, I can't tell you for sure, but I believe it was one that was purchased on Door County 
um, and it actually was purchased by the Nature Conservancy, and then they uh, donated it to the state natural areas program. So it's okay. becomes part of a larger area. <laughs> the, the interesting thing is a, a woman or purchased the land and in it, a guy had been raising buffalo in the middle of it. So oh. they had to take the fences down and clear that out. But it's oh. now become an extension of a, a great state natural area. And so I think that's one of the newest uh, acquisitions that have occurred. So it's quite common to get more and more of these popping up. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dozens a year. Um, oh, wow. Increasing by. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Interesting. Well, that was the last question I think that came in the chat. Um, I want to give a few reminders to everybody. First of all, Eric, this was great. It was very thought provoking for sure. You see some questions, you see some comments in the chat if you glance over there. Um, I did want to mention if people didn't get the City Times yet, we have a wonderful article that highlighted our very own Kent Hall, of course. And if you got the newsletter, you would have seen this article as well. So you've got um, us being, you know, all the Audubon, really Kent, and the work he does for Stevens Point to be recognized as the Bird City for the 12th consecutive year, again, at high flyer status. Kent, we always are so grateful for you um, and, and the continuation of that recognition is really wonderful. Thank, thank you. Yeah, anything more you want to say? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing uh, other than I've seen the Kalima Warbler, Eric. You have, Ken. I thought maybe. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to make a mention, just a heads up, that we are about to launch our 30 by 60 by 90 challenge. It's a solar project for Schmeekly. As you know, the Aldo Leopold Audubon Society does work for trying to advocate for and fundraise for different projects. Our project that's going to be the focus of April and May is joining the 30, the 60, or the 90 club. So two people um, have already donated to that. You can donate on our website, www.aldoleopoldaudubon.org. If you'd like to join the 30, 60, or 90 challenge um, for solar for Schmeekly, you can learn more on our website. And we'll also have more information coming up in the newsletter. Um, this, What I mean by 30, 60, and 90 is donating at the 30 level, the 60 level, or the 90 level. And you're part of the club. Um, we are trying to reach $3,000 raised in the next two months, um, although Leopold Audubon is matching that with another $3,000 to try to get an award of $6,000 to Schmeekly to support their solar project. Our next program is April 21st, the downward spiral and insect declines and why they matter. Um, we'll be announcing the speaker for that. Sorry, I don't have the speaker's name for that yet, but we'll get that up there. And is, I is, can, I, can I mention that real quickly? Yes, uh, please do. <laughs> his name is Dan Young, and he's a professor of entomology from uh, down in Madison, and he's been um, researching and talking on the subject for a long time, so I, I think it'll be a fascinating um, discussion. He's going to talk about what's causing the decline and about what the implications of the insect decline are for Wisconsin here in particular. Oh, wow. Great. If you want to just send me that information, I'll get it up as well on the web. Um, mm -hmm. That is April 21st. And again, registration is already open for that. It's going to be on Zoom as well. Um, just another mention, Junior Audubon, it's going very well. We're on our fifth bird. Um, the, the youth have chosen and they chose the ruby-throated hummingbird for our May 12th. Junior Audubon drawing birds with Karen Sig. She's an amazing local artist who has really done some great work of turning us all into artists. So everyone's welcome to join. We do target those youth. So if you have grandchildren or do you have children or um, if you'd like to join as well, we're all children at heart. So you're welcome to join that. Those have been really fun. Our next board meeting is, our board meetings are always the second Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m. We always welcome you to join. If you have the desire to help with social media, Audubon's looking for some help with that. So if you want to volunteer, but maybe you don't want to serve on the board, we are always looking for volunteers. And that's one particular area we're looking for someone um, 
Also field trip ideas. We're always welcoming some field trip ideas. And if you would like to serve on the board, please join us at our next meeting on Wednesday, um, the second Wednesday of the month, I forget the exact date at 7 p.m. With that, Eric, thank you so much. And, and all the board members tonight, I know there's several of us on. Thank you. And we hope you had a, um, a enjoyable time watching the presentation, which was great. Thanks, thanks Eric. Um, and have a good evening, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Great job. Thank you, Ned. No, I'm trying.